Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, let me uh, thank Walter for the many years, and, and Walter's family, and many other people for putting these conferences on year after year, perhaps not every year, but year after year. Uh, it's really a great service that many of us appreciate. I want to talk to you about what I call the uh, Renaissance effect. Many of you, if not absolutely everyone, has heard of the Renaissance. It was a time roughly 13th century to 16th century in Europe where there was a great flourishing of the arts. There was painting, uh, sculpture, architecture. But there was also something else that was happening in that era, which is a renaissance of thought. And there were many key uh, thinkers of the renaissance, uh, beginning with Petrarch in uh, the 1300s. He was a church father, a, uh, a priest within the uh, Catholic church. But he was one of the first thinkers to suggest that Man had a role, man had a importance outside of just being the, the creature of an all-powerful God. And so he is credited with being the first humanist thinker. Copernicus, most of you probably have heard of him, uh, he was the first of the medieval scientists to uh, suggest that the earth rotates around the sun, and that the sun was uh, really the center of things. More significantly than his assertion that the earth rotated around the sun was how he got there. He got there through mathematical calculations in combination with observation. So it was one of the, the beginnings of the scientific process. Sir Francis Bacon, um, really was the first thinker to suggest a methodical scientific method. Not exactly the one we have today, but it basically had the, the core ideas that you set forth a hypothesis, you made some observations, and you came up with a conclusion, and he set it out. Again, the, the critical thing there is um, that he established a methodology based on a rational, reasonable process. Thomas Hobbes um, is best known for a concept that we know today as the social contract. In his time, governments were all powerful. They had all rights, and people had none. And Hobbes was the first thinker to put forward the notion that governments derive their power from people and that individuals make a contract, a social contract, with the government and with society to be ruled, to, to give some of their rights to the government for the betterment of everyone. But the government was borrowing those rights. The government didn't have those rights. Descartes, um, whom we know most famously for his Cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am, was a um, very clear-minded rationalist. And more than just an advocate of reason, he made the case that truth can be arrived at by the process of reason, rather than by revelation or by commandment, as the uh, environment of his time would have it. So these thinkers really ushered in what uh, became known as the Age of Enlightenment or the Age of Reason, the Age of Science that came after them. And they were tremendously influential on the centuries beyond them. And this is why the Renaissance is um, given so much um, interest in, and studied so deeply. It's because of the later impact. What's often forgotten is the Renaissance, the word, means rebirth. So rebirth of what exactly? Well, there was another period earlier in history that we know of as classical Greece. 
And classical Greece was also a time when the arts flourished. Sculpture rose to a very high level. Architecture still admired and, and uh, influential, even after all that time. And classical Greece also had its profound thinkers. Thales, one of the first Greek philosophers, was also considered to be a father of humanism. Many things have many fathers. And he, in his context, said that man has an important place in the universe and that he's not just the pawn of the gods. Pythagoras, as we know, was a mathematician, <clears throat> but he was additionally a, um, a methodical uh, thinker who employed reason and logic to arrive at uh, his conclusions. Cleisthenes, often called the father of democracy, he's sort of um, Thomas Hobbes' counterpart in the Renaissance, because Cleisthenes was the first man to suggest that uh, Athens should rule itself by voting, and that <clears throat> not everybody, in fact, very few people actually got to vote. But the notion that um, the power rests with the people, which is literally what democracy means, was uh, unique in its time. The experiment, if you will, that Cleisthenes uh, began running was pretty much a fiasco. It turned into kind of a mob rule. One of the great ironies of Cleisthenes' democracy is that the vote was taken and Cleisthenes was exiled for being too powerful. So it didn't work, but the idea was there. Socrates, we know, also uh, for his writings, and he really championed this notion uh, as did Descartes, that you can reason your way to the truth, that it doesn't have to be just given to you. And if you read the dialogues of Socrates and Plato, uh, they're all extremely rational, if this is true, then this must be true, and so forth. And then finally, Aristotle, um, we can credit in part with a early, early version of the scientific method where he had a methodical approach to the study and observation of the natural world. So obviously, as I described, the thinkers of the Renaissance and these thinkers of the uh, era of classical Greece, the parallels are, are really obvious and really uh, clear. Now, most historians, say that this is an accident, that after classical Greece had its heyday, and it was overthrown, overshadowed by the Roman Empire, and a lot of these original thinkers, uh, books, and teachings were lost, and that they resurfaced by accident in the 12th, 13th, and 14th century AD and that it was just a, a fluke that these books came back to light at the time when the Renaissance thinkers were wrestling with these same issues. But there might well be another explanation than just an accident. And if we look at the cycle of the Yugas, as uh, Walter already introduced, we have this notion that the consciousness of man goes through phases, and it does so from a high point to a low point at 500 AD. It will rise again until it reaches the high point again in 12,500 AD. And along the way, mankind goes through very distinct phases of uh, understanding, of awareness, of capabilities. And that there's kind of a mirror, so the, the consciousness of this 
period of descending treta is similar to ascending treta, and the consciousness of Dwapara uh, similarly is like Dwapara that we're entering now, and that the Kali Yugas had a similar consciousness. So if we take this uh, circle and instead put it in a straight line, uh, again, we're just going to take the Kali Yugas here, so from 700 BC to 500 AD, 500 AD to 1700. And then if we stand them side by side here, again, they're still the same period of time, 700 BC to 500 AD, 500 AD to 1700 AD. And then we put in the era of the Renaissance, and then we put in the era of classical Greece, we'll see that they were, they existed in the same uh, sector of those yugas. And what Sri Yukteswar argues and Yogananda argues is that's because mankind is tuning into thoughts rather than inventing those thoughts. And that as we go through the, uh, the cycle, both descending and ascending, the instrument which, with which we tune into thoughts, the physical body, the brain, the nervous system, gets more and more refined. And therefore, we're able to draw in more or less refined ideas, depending on where we're living in the yugas. So one has to ask, was, was this in fact a fluke that this fit so well? Uh, that they, the Renaissance and the era of classical Greece fell so neatly into that same sector. And so uh, we can look into another aspect of the ancient past. Now I'm adding to those periods, this goes into um, descending Dwapara Yuga and into ascending Dwapara Yuga. So it's more than just the Kali Yugas. Um, and it goes from 1200 BC to 500 AD, 500 AD to 2200 AD. So if we look at the, at the history, if we look at the rise and fall of empires and civilizations, we'll begin to see that there is also a matching pattern. So in the first part of ascending Kali Yuga, there was a period of collapsing empires. Uh, the Mayan collapse in 700 AD, uh, Teotihuacan, uh, believed to be uh, the largest city in the world at the time, anywhere from 250 to a million, 250,000 to a million people. Uh, it was destroyed, <coughs> excuse me. The Guptas in India fell in 500 AD. If we look to the descending portion of the Yugas in the same sector, we'll see a similar pattern. This is when China uh, broke apart into warring uh, factions and kingdoms. Uh, Rome fell famously in 476. Persia also fell at that time. And if we look uh, throughout the world, what we'll see is things ending, not just ending and becoming something new, but just ending, it just collapsed. Uh, from this period here, 2200 AD, uh, or 220 AD to roughly 700 AD, nothing could stay together. The, the history throughout the world broke down into smaller and smaller um, principalities, warlords, uh, raiding groups. It was a, it was the pits. And uh, we know this popularly, this section particularly, as the Dark Ages. And it's considered that around the world. So then what happens as we go up in time in the Kali Yuga on the ascending side? We see a period of consolidation. Uh, we see uh, conquest bringing together vast territories. Charlemagne reunited uh, Gaul, uh, which we know as France today. 
The Holy Roman Empire gained control of most of uh, Europe. Uh, Genghis Khan uh, united all the Mongolian tribes and parts of northern China all the way into the Russian steppes. Tamerlane, also known as Timur, uh, also was a, uh, a conqueror in the uh, sort of Caspian Sea, Russian steppe area. So we see this pattern of bloody reconsolidation of empires. New empires, not the old empires, but consolidation nonetheless. If we look to the past, we see the exact same pattern in that same sector of descending Kali Yuga. So that was the period of Alexander the Great, uh, whose empire stretched from uh, Macedonia, Greece, all the way to India, uh, included Egypt at one time. Ashoka the Great in India uh, united what had been at his time, the beginning of descending Kali Yuga, a fractured uh, political landscape and was one of the first to unite most of what is now, we would now consider uh, modern day India. Uh, Qin, Emperor Qin of China, united the five warring kingdoms of, of China, and finally Julius Caesar of the Romans, through conquest, united uh, most of Europe, uh, Northern Africa, even parts of the Near East and, and Egypt. These were not great times, obviously. Uh, they were, uh, these conquests were achieved through might and through carnage, but there was at least this coming together of things rather than the collapse. So now if we move forward into uh, the modern era, what we find is that we have entered a period of rapid political change. Um, from 1700 AD to the present, we've seen many, many uh, rapid conquering, uh, uh, releasing formations, uh, things coming apart. One of the best ways to get a glimpse of that is to look at the uh, colonization that the Europeans set out on in the, in the uh, late 1600s, early 1700s. This is a map that is a picture of what was colonized in the world by the European powers. So you can see that by 1750, there were uh, significant bits of land, uh, countries that were ruled by these European powers. Well, if we fast forward 150 years, we'll see that almost the entire world was under the sway of the European powers. And then if we fast forward another 100 years, we'll see that almost none of it is under the sway, or at least not the direct sway any longer, of the European powers. Now, this doesn't even touch on uh, the, the near continuous border changes in Africa or in the Middle East, and we see it happening today. We see Ukraine, we see ISIS, uh, political boundaries, political maps. It's a good time to be a map maker if you, you know, want to have a steady income because the world map continuously changes. So if we look to the past, do we see a similar uh, result? And, and we do. There's an era known as the Bronze Age Collapse, which if we look at a uh, map of what existed before and during that Bronze Age Collapse, we'll see that the Shang Dynasty uh, existed in China and it was overthrown in 1046. The uh, succeeding dynasty uh, lasted only a couple hundred years. Uh, the uh, Northern India, the, the, the biggest empire at the time, was what is based in the Karava Pandava War, the Mahabharata uh, details it. It collapsed by the 8th century. And then there's a whole host of empires 
And most people don't even remember. The Assyrians, the Hittites, the Ugarids, the Kassites, the Mycenaeans, they all perished between roughly 1200 and 700 BC. We see the pattern in Central America, the Olmecs, um, which had existed for almost 1500 years. They disappeared. So there's some consciousness, there's some force that influences man in, to, to create these similar patterns. Now, the, the main patterns here we see is the disintegration of empires, followed by the consolidation of empires, followed by this era of rapid change. The good news for us is that the period before 1200 BC was relatively stable, and um, there was not a great deal of war in the middle of that Dwapara Yuga. So if we can we manage to get ourselves through this last hundred years, uh, things may settle down. It doesn't do us a lot of good, but at least makes you feel positive about the future. So there's one more example of the, the Renaissance effect that I'd like to share with you, which I think is much more uh, significant to us personally, uh, certainly to uh, probably most of you who are here. And this is that from uh, 1700 AD to today, compared to uh, 700 BC, 14, uh, 1014 BC, so this, this is the beginning of, or the end of descending Dwapara Yuga, and this is the beginning of ascending Dwapara Yuga. And there's one particular trend, there's many trends that we could pick, but a particular trend is uh, the more or less modern Western discovery of subtle energy. And some of the uh, first discoverers included uh, Hanuman, who developed homeopathy in the 1790s. Basically, what Hanuman said is the, the vibration, the subtle energy left over after a homeopathic remedy had been created was far more powerful and far more important than the physical substance from which that uh, vibratory essence was derived. So he was one of the first uh, Westerners to uh, heal with vibratory energy, to heal with subtle energy. In the 1890s, chiropractic was uh, developed, and the basic notion of chiropractic is that we have energy flowing through our nervous system, and if we can keep our spine healthy and our nerve channels open, then we'll be healthy automatically because it's the life force flowing through the body that heals us, not outside effects so much. Psychology was um, also, in a way, a uh, exploration of subtle energy because the early psychologists realized that people don't behave in a reasoned, rational way. The I, the ego, is not always in charge. And there's this whole other part of us, the subconscious, that actually um, enlivens us and drives us with this uh, energy of our being that um, is oftentimes dissociated with our normal, rational, daily awareness. Biofeedback came along in the 1960s. Basically, that biofeedback said, you can control subtle energy if you have an indirect way of uh, measuring it. So if you have a, uh, a sunrise on a television screen that if you slow down your metabolism, it makes the sunrise being hooked up to heart rate monitors and so forth. You can actually learn to control the life force. Holistic medicine became popular in the 1960s. 60s. Uh, pioneers like uh, John, John Borosenko, uh, Candace Perk actually discovered scientifically that our thoughts influence the uh, chemical reactions in the body, that there's a direct one-to-one -one, um, relationship between what we feel and what we think 
and what our body is doing physiologically. And this paved the way to more thinking about the, the body as a, a whole, and that mind, emotions, thoughts, and body are, are perfectly interrelated. You can't really separate them. And then finally, interestingly enough, not in the West, but in the Eastern Bloc during the uh, Soviet Union days, there was a lot of experimentation done to actually try to measure life force. In the West, it's still, if you, if you suggest to your uh, PhD advisor that you want to do a, uh, your PhD thesis on measuring life force, you would get a very strong no, don't go there. But in the East, there was no such bias towards it. And they actually, a number of groups, were able to uh, measure a real effect of subtle energy from, um, from biological material, often referred to as torsion energy. So these, if you will, are the, the children of Western science that we're talking about here, or at least Western thinkers. Homeopathy, chiropractic, biofeedback, etc. But just like the Renaissance in medieval Europe, a lot of this exploration was inspired by an ancient time in the past when life force was far better understood. And in fact, if we look back to this era, we'll find that uh, life force was a commonplace concept existed in India, in China, in Egypt, and they all had a name for it, and it's woven into all of the uh, writings we have from those times. There were life force tools developed, like pranayama, like qigong, uh, like tai chi, although just the seeds of tai chi, not the tai chi we know today. Mind-body medicine was the medicine of this period of time. And it was very well uh, thought through. They were very streamlined and elegant systems of mind-body medicine, where ours are still kind of finding their way, if you will. The principles are there, but the, uh, the actual practices and um, recipes of how to maintain your health in this holistic way, is, we're still sort of stumbling towards it. But if you look to Ayurveda or traditional Chinese medicine and Egyptian medicine, which doesn't get a lot of attention these days, but Egyptian medicine too, wove in with knowledge of anatomy and use of herbs, a uh, thorough knowledge of life force, how to stimulate it, how to make it uh, work for you to make you healthy. And then of course, what also existed was meditation. And that meditation that's capturing so much interest in our era was, again, commonplace in descending to Apara. So we could say that we are in a new renaissance of these concepts that existed in the past. So I'll leave you with a couple of my favorite quotes. <laughs> And, a little more humorously, <laughs> so I've seen a lot of rhyming going on. And we'll so do so in the future. And then I uh, always like to finish with what I call my shameless commerce sign, uh, slide. Um, and I, I want to acknowledge my uh, co-author, uh, David Steinmetz. Uh, David, do you want to stand up? and? just heard me uh, describe here is in the Yuga's books, but there uh, uh, is a lot more in there that you might find interesting. So thank you very much.